And I'm getting out in seven months. That's what you think. But you start something, sister, and so help me, I'll beat your brains out if I rot here the rest of my life. Hello to all the classic people that are returning. I'm glad you're back. I want to welcome any new visitors. As a technical note, references and citations are listed for each show on the site at classicmovierev.com. Today on the Classic Movie Reviews podcast, we are taking on the story of Molly X, 1949. I picked this film noir to watch based solely on the title. The fact that it had Charles McGraw in it was a nice bonus. If you haven't read the fantastic biography, Charles McGraw, film noir's tough guy, I highly recommend it. The author, Alan K. Rohde, was terrific when I interviewed him. Give it a listen if you haven't already. On imdb.com, this film has a decent 7.0 rating. It has no ratings on RottenTomatoes.com. This is the first time that I've run into a movie that is not rated on Rotten Tomatoes. I went ahead and gave it one. New York Times film critic Bosley Carruthers said in a lukewarm December 2, 1949 review, quote, It is remarkable what a little fresh air, a little sunshine, and a few kind words do for a lady criminal who is considerately put away in a model women's prison in The Story of Molly X. This lady, played by June Havoc, very soon takes heart, begins to smile, and even becomes a minor heroine when the boiler in the laundry explodes. Unquote. He continues later with, quote, This film on the Criterion screen carries a great deal more sentiment than conviction. Miss Havoc may look mighty sweet, but she certainly doesn't overwhelm you with a sense of her cold recalcitrance, not even when she hauls back and mutters such clearly unladylike things as, You start something, and so help me, I'll beat your brains out, sister. Unquote. So, there's not much to love out there for this film. Let's check out the actors. Actors. Right, and I'm a Shakespearean actor. Charles McGraw has a relatively small role as Police Captain Breen. When he's on screen, he chews nails. McGraw was covered in the excellent film noir, The Narrow Margin, 1952. Veteran actress Kathleen Freeman was uncredited as a seamstress convict. June Havoc played the lady gangster Molly X. She was born in 1912 in Canada. June's mother was Rose Thompson Hovick, and her sister was the famous stripper Gypsy Rose Lee. Her famous stage mother pushed her into vaudeville by age two. Baby June appeared in Hal Roach shorts between 1918 and 1924. By the age of five, she was a leading act, making $1,500 a week at her peak. To escape her mother and life in vaudeville, June ran away and got married at 13. When the Great Depression hit, work in vaudeville collapsed, as did the youthful marriage. During the 1930s, she kept her daughter fed by modeling and dancing in marathons. She also worked in stock musicals and in the Borscht Belt. June debuted on Broadway in 1936. By 1940, her stage career took off. Her next round of movies began in 1942. June was relegated to B-movies and continued to work on stage. She hit a good streak playing a femme fatale in Intrigue, 1947, a racist in Gentleman's Agreement, 1947, and a gangster in The Story of Molly X, 1949. Her lesser films include the crime film The Iron Curtain, 1948, Film Noir, Chicago Deadline, 1949, Once a Thief, 1950, and the mystery Lady Possessed, 1952. She worked extensively on television beginning in the 1950s. She had a series, Willie, 1954 to 55. Following the death of her mother, June and her sister Gypsy decided they could write their memoirs. Gypsies led to a musical and a film. Upset over the portrayal of June, the two sisters did not talk for years. Following the film Three for Jamie Dawn, 1956, June worked almost exclusively on stage and television. She also wrote and directed. Her last television credit was in 1989. She died in 2010. John Russell played hardened guy robber Cash Brady. Russell was born in 1921 in California. He attended the University of California. When World War II broke out, Russell joined the U.S. Marine Corps. He was assigned as an intelligence officer on Guadalcanal. Although there are conflicting reports, the preponderance indicates that he left the military as a result of malaria 
and was not wounded as reported on imdb.com. Russell began getting credited film roles in 1945. He was very entertaining as the highwayman Black Jack Mallard in Forever Amber 1947. He was in a lot of westerns like Yellow Sky 1948, Saddle Tramp 1950, Rio Bravo 1959, The Outlaw Josie Wales 1976, and Pale Rider 1985. His film noir roles include The Dark Corner 1946, The Story of Molly X 1949, Undertow 1949, and Hoodlum Empire 1952. Russell worked extensively in television and had a Western series, Lawman 1958 to 62. He died in 1991. Dorothy Hart played the jealous and vengeful Anne. Hart was born in Ohio in 1922. She earned a BA from Western Reserve University. The natural beauty was also voted homecoming queen. Hart worked as a model and appeared on many popular magazine covers. Her friend entered her in Columbia Pictures National Cover Girl Contest in 1944. She won the competition and was offered a movie contract. Feeling she wasn't ready, she studied at the Cleveland Playhouse. Several years later, Hart was signed by Columbia for Gunfighter 1947. Universal then signed Hart. However, the company did not know how to use the beauty and assigned her to costume dramas, Tarzan movies, westerns, and prison sagas. Some of her movies include Down to Earth 1947, Film Noir's The Naked City 1948, The Story of Molly X 1949, I Was a Communist for the FBI 1951, and Lone Shark 1952. Also, there was Tarzan's Savage Fury 1952. For Lone Shark 1952, she replaced the ill Gail Russell that I talked about in Angel and the Bad Man 1947. Hart left film in 1952 and worked on television. She worked with the United Nations Children's Programs. She died in 2004. Story. Let me explain. No, there is too much. Let me sum up. In San Francisco, near the end of World War II, Molly X, June Havoc, is telling her story. Our part of the story begins at the top of the mark as Molly surveys the wealth of San Francisco and wants it all for herself. She says she was taken in by Satan's trick. Somehow it made me think of a certain tough character in history's oldest book. A character called Satan who said, Bow down and worship me and all this will be yours. And I believed every word of it. She says she is using fake names and then gives a sailor the heave ho. Cash Brady, John Russell, Rod Markle, Elliot Lewis, and Ann, Dorothy Hart, Rod's girlfriend, arrive at the restaurant. Rod is already flirting with Molly. Molly has invited Cash and Rod in from Kansas City and is surprised to see Ann tagging along. Molly's husband had been murdered and the police don't know who did it. Anne implies that Molly might know who killed her husband. After some more cracks, Rod threatens to kill Anne if she keeps talking. Molly says they are there for business and make Anne leave the table. Rod gives her the command, drift. Molly tells Rod to send Anne back to KC. She tells him that she is setting up a gang of her own and will be doing some robberies. She says Cash was her dead husband's best friend and he throws in with the gang. Molly is acting as a rich widow and the gang begins robbing professionals, transporting goods or money. The first robbery is a crash and grab. The gang is happy with the take and Rod is sucking up bad. Ann shows up at the hideout even though she had been sent back to Kansas City two weeks earlier. Getting catty with Molly, Ann thinks Molly is trying to take Rod away from her. Ann slaps Molly and Molly says her business with Rod is strictly professional. She warns Ann to stay out of her way. World War II ends and the people are partying in the streets. Molly's gang has a job planned for that night. Molly hides in the ladies' room of a store next to the jewelry store. She waits until both stores close before she comes out. She doesn't know that in addition to the alarm system, the safe is also protected by chemical warfare gas. The male members of the gang drive up and Molly opens the street elevator for them. They break through the wall and reach the safe in the jewelry store. Molly is wearing heels. Cash begins cutting through the safe door, but hits a tripwire. The alarm goes off and all of the men are sprayed with gas. Most of them run away, but Molly makes Rod go back to save Cash. The police are near and the gang drops the unconscious Cash on the sidewalk. 
Molly, Rod, and another man make a getaway. One police officer stays with Cash, and the other gives Chase in his car. Rod is in his apartment when Molly shows up. Molly says someone turned her name over to the police, and they are looking for her. She believes the rat is Ann. Rod picks this time to make a play for Molly. He says he will help her escape, but only if she becomes his girlfriend. I've always been crazy for you, baby. I'm still not interested, Rod. You'd better be, because you're in a tough spot, and I'm the only one who can get you out of it. Oh? Cash and I have got a car planted in the garage in the back of this building. Okay, let's use it. On one condition. It's you and me from now on. How about your girlfriend, Ann? Forget about Ann. Let her mess up some other guy's life. First time I saw you, I said to myself, that's for me. And someday I'm going to move in. Rick was in the way, but I knew I could take care of him. Remember the time he was drunk and he hit you? That's when I made up my mind he had to go. Then Rod confesses that he killed Molly's husband because Rod wanted Molly. Rod kisses Molly. She pulls a 38 out of her purse and drills Rod. As Molly heads down the stairs, she meets Cash coming up. He had pretended to be knocked out, and when he got his chance, he escaped from the cop. Molly tells Cash that she killed Rod for killing her husband. Cash and Molly take Rod's body and put it on a refrigerated train car that is heading east. Cash has a place in town where he and Molly can hide out from the police. At the hideout, Cash takes Molly's gun and throws it on top of the phone booth. It looks like the top of the phone booth has never been cleaned. When they get into the boarding room, the police come to the door and fire escape. The detective at the door is Police Captain Breen, Charles McGraw, so no one is getting away. Molly and Cash are arrested for the robbery. The police have already caught two members of the gang, and they have confessed to everyone's role in the robbery. Breen's the name. Suppose we all go over to my office and have a little talk. What about? You have nothing on us. Then why are you going down the fire escape? We're eccentric. Oh, so am I. You're both under arrest. On what charge? Grand theft. Bank and jewelry store. We picked up two of your mob, Max Hayden and Frankie Morgan. They both sang like a Christmas choir. Police Captain Breen wants to know where Rod is, and he offers Molly a minimum sentence. She plays dumb. Rod's body is found on the train when it reaches New York. At trial, the minor gang members testify against Molly, saying she was the ringleader. Molly confronts Ann about ratting the gang out, and she fires back that Molly killed Rod. You phoned the cops, told them who I was and where they could find me. That's your guess. To get me, you put the skids under all of us. You can thank yourself for what happened to... I know what happened to Rod. You killed him. You're crazy. Why should I? I'll find out. You can't get away from it, Molly. They're going to put you on ice, right where I can lay my hands on you. They sentence Molly to the women's prison at Tehachapi. Tehachapi is the same prison that Samuel Spade told Bridget O'Shaughnessy that she might get sent to if she's lucky in the Maltese Falcon 1941. It's referred to in quite a few other film noirs as well. Anne searches the gang's apartment and finds nothing she can give to Captain Breen, even though she walked right by the gun's location in the lobby. Captain Breen has come up with dead ends as well. Breen explains rifling marks and shows her the bullet that killed her boyfriend Rod. Molly arrives at Tehachapi, or as it is officially named, the California Institute for Women, on Christmas Eve. She is wearing furs and jewelry. It looks like a sizable European estate. The warden, the guards, and most of the convicts are friendly. Tehachapi at the time was a modern prison that seeks to reform the prisoners. Molly is a hard case and is resistant to everyone. They have every character at the prison. A repeat offender? A first-time regret-filled husband killer? A woman that sneaks food for her pet cat? And a lady waiting to be executed or have her sentence commuted? There's no scrounger in this one. The warden says everyone is given an indeterminate sentence. After six months, they go before a board that determines how long their sentence will be. The film added a new term to my film noir lexicon, a short story writer for a forger. Feels good to get out of quarantine, doesn't it? It sure does. So this is the college campus. Yeah, this is where we live and learn. Which cottage have I been assigned to? Davis, last one on the left. I'm on the house council at Davis. Sort of a trustee. No, they don't use that system here. House councils help out with the new girls like I'm doing with you. What are you in for, Vera? Forgery. Short story writer. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I didn't know how to write a happy ending. 
After her time in quarantine, Molly is assigned a job in the sewing factory. Molly gets a tough but friendly cellmate. She refuses to work and stays locked in her room. The only privilege Molly has is community meals. The other cons snub her because she won't work. The hidden gun and the murder of Rod weigh heavily on Molly as she stays locked in isolation. The professional staff worry about Molly and her problem. Just like Johnny Ringo, Molly is mad about being born. Molly is fixated on the condemned woman. She finds out the execution is to go forward. On the day of the execution, all of the women are tense. Molly finally breaks down. She asks for a job and says she will take anything. Please, help me. Help me. Put me to work. Anything you've got, the tougher the better. Please, give me a job that I can do with my hands. Something that'll tire me out so that I can sleep. Please. I can't go back in that room again. I can't. Molly begins working in the laundry. It's a steam-filled hellhole. She gets into a conflict with one of the guards. Molly bumps into another woman and they get into a fist fight. Suddenly, a boiler blows and the room is filled with scalding steam. Molly jumps right into action, pulling people out. She clears a jam and opens an escape window for a crowd of women. Molly finds a woman screaming and frozen by fear. She gives her five slaps to get her moving. It's just like Forrest Gump saving those men in Vietnam. Help me, Forrest, help me. I gotta find Bubba. The warden comes and they realize the guard is still inside. She tries to enter, but it's too hot. Suddenly, Molly comes out of the steam carrying the guard. Molly has a new attitude, but her friend can't get her to go to church. The review board comes and they are mostly women. They bring in Molly and she talks about getting rid of her hate. She won't give any information about her family and the board is concerned. They give her seven years with a review in two years. Captain Breen comes to see Molly. He is totally against prison reform and only wants to punish. She's been difficult, but we have hopes that she'll respond to treatment. <sighs> treatment? You don't believe in the new penal system, do you? Tell me, what are you running here? A prison or a country club? There was a time in this state when criminals were sent away to be punished, not to be pampered. Our girls are not pampered. They're simply given another chance to become useful citizens. You know, from what I've seen of this place, the gals of the outside are liable to start a crime wave in order to get in here. There is no substitute for freedom. Breen asks about her and Cash's guns. Breen thinks Cash killed Rod because he was in love with Molly also. Winter comes again and the ladies are having a dance. All of the female dancing partners are racially segregated. Molly is the life of the party until she sees Anne come in as a new prisoner. Anne is still on about the killing of Rod. Molly and I were great pals in Kansas City. I knew her husband, Rick. And she knew my boyfriend, Rod and Marco. Rod was killed, murdered. Anne says she will get the evidence on Molly and Molly says she will beat her brains out if she messes with her parole. I've had plenty of trouble here, but that's all changed now. And I'm getting out in seven months. That's what you think. But you start something, sister, and so help me. I'll beat your brains out if I rot here the rest of my life. The new inmate is not making any friends in prison. Anne says the police have checked the old gang's hideout. She also talks about the bullet. One day, Molly is working in the cutting room, and Anne starts needling her about the gun. The lady from the Los Angeles Parole Board comes and talks to the ladies that are getting out. They say they get them jobs and a place to live. A lot of small items in the prison are being stolen. Molly goes back to her room and one of the cons has found the missing items in Molly's laundry. Molly says she will produce the thief or take the rap. During a softball game, Molly grabs Anne and forces her into a circle of women behind one of the buildings. They start duking it out. When Anne pulls her hair, Molly says none of that girl stuff. One year part of you and I'll break your arm. Come on. Girl. Keep your hands off me! My clothes are out of here! A showdown. If I told you the facts, you wouldn't have come, you stinker. Oh, Oy, you... Look out, boy. <laughs> None of that cat stuff. They throw some tremendous uppercuts. Molly beats the truth out of Anne. When a guard comes, they say Anne fell out of a tree. The warden is in communication with Captain Breen. Anne, with hate in her eyes, watches Molly leave the prison. Molly rides the train to Los Angeles. 
She's about to jump a train for San Francisco when the parole officer shows up and takes charge. Molly is told she cannot leave town. Molly is given a job in the cutting room of a dress factory by a man named Chris Renbow, Wally Mayer. He is taken by the dress that Molly has designed. One day, Renbow gets a letter saying Molly is a murderer. It looks like he is firing her, but he is promoting her to design. You've got a new job. I thought I was fired. Not a chance in the world. After she leaves, Renbow tears up the letter from Anne. When Renbow takes Molly home, he tries to be her boyfriend. Molly says she can't. Anne is hiding in the shadows, listening to the conversation. When Renbow leaves, Anne says Captain Breen has arrested Cash for the murder of Rod. She says they have found the murder weapon. Molly takes the bait and flies to San Francisco. Anne reports this information to Captain Breen. Molly goes straight to the old hideout and retrieves the gun from the top of the phone booth. Captain Breen is watching from behind a cracked door. Molly goes straight to Captain Breen's office to turn in the gun. Captain Breen comes in right behind her. She turns the gun over to Breen and says it is the weapon that killed Rod. They take Molly's statement. They then bring Cash into the room. Cash, Molly has confessed she shot Rod Markle. Is that right, baby? You know that's true. You haven't got it quite straight, kid. They can prove that the slug they dug out of Marco was fired from my gun, not from yours. I killed him, Cash. You know it. You're lying. You're trying to get me off, and I won't let you do it. Now, wait a minute. I like you, yes, but not that good. Cash tells her that she is not the murderer. He says when she shot, her bullet hit Rod's shoulder holster. Cash says he killed Rod for killing Molly's husband. Cash and Captain Breen see that Molly has changed. Captain Breen says he may be wrong about prison reform. They left out the part about Molly getting charged with a parole violation, having a gun as a convicted felon, consorting with other known felons. It doesn't wrap up so easily if she goes back to prison. I'll be right back with the conclusion and world famous short summary following a word from our sponsors. Summary A lot of the information below is summarized from Hollywood Goes to Prison an article in the April 2005 Tehachapi News by Eric W. Jepson. Jepson thinks the first movie filmed in the town of Tehachapi was The Lady of the Dugout, 1918. The movie featured Al and Frank Jennings who were cowboy outlaws. One of the Jennings' real robberies included using too much dynamite and blowing up the safe, the train car, and all the money during a train robbery. A scene like this was seen in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, 1969. Other than the Maltese Falcon 1941 reference, and in this movie as well, Tehachapi is mentioned in many film noirs. These include Double Indemnity 1944, where Walter Neff laments about a female murderer saying, all she collected was a 3 to 10 stretch in Tehachapi. The movie Nocturne 1946 talks about Tehachapi debutantes, while The Hunted 1948 has a woman that has gotten out of Tehachapi. If you find more, please leave a note in the comments. Y'all should know that I'm a big Bugs Bunny fan. In A Thousand and One Rabbit Tales, a play on A Thousand and One Arabian Nights, Bugs tells the Sultan's son that the witch in Hansel and Gretel was sent to Tehachapi. World famous short summary, never confess. This isn't Perry Mason. I hope you enjoyed today's show. You can find connections to social media and email on the site at classicmoviereb.com or in the podcast show notes. If you enjoyed the show, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. If you've already subscribed, you can tell a friend, colleague, or family member about the show or leave a review at Apple Podcast. It really helps the show get found. If you want to comment, suggest a movie, or help out, contact me by email at jec at classicmoviereb.com. Beware the moors. <laughs>